Are you ready, kids? Hello, it's Employee A Million, and welcome back to a brand new year of SpongeComs. Today's episode is Season 4, Episode 9, or Episode 69 overall, Krusty Towers and Mrs. Puff You're Fired, both of which originally premiered on April 1st, 2006. We are firmly in 2006 now, we're firmly in Season 4. This actually aired right before the 2006 Kids' Choice Awards, so... Yeah, we're getting through the 2000s, we're getting through the decade where Spongebob was at its peak in cultural dominance, but with episodes like this, it still seemed to be at a high, so let's keep this going. Krusty Towers was written by Luke Brookshire, Tom King, and Stephen Banks, and it's a pretty well-received episode for this time and this era. There was actually a rumor on Encyclopedia Spongebobia years ago that this was just a season 3 script they had laying around that they reworked into season 4, or even some kind of holdover episode, which was always just a bunch of nonsense. This was always made for season 4 first and foremost. And I think the dead giveaway is that it is a slight parody of something, rather than being its own original thing, which season 4 had a little bit more of. The name Krusty Towers sort of invokes the British sitcom Faulty Towers, which aired in the 1970s. It's about this guy called Basil Faulty, played by John Cleese, who runs a hotel. Shenanigans ensue as he struggles to keep the plates spinning, or even tolerate his guests. But uh, it was an enormous success. It only aired for 12 episodes, but it's considered one of the greatest British TV shows of all time. But uh, this episode isn't really a full-on Faulty Towers homage. It's not exactly a parody of the plot structure of an average Faulty Towers episode. If you want that, there's already a cat dog episode that does that. This is just an excuse to turn the Krusty Krab into a hotel and see what happens. This is actually one of my favorite Krusty Krab redecorations because the background artist pulled out all the stops in making it seem like Mr. Krabs actually spent a pretty penny on making this place livable <laughs> instead of just doing a rush job, which he probably would have done a little further into the post-movie era. But uh, here he's fully committed to the bit of just making a fancy hotel just so he can charge more for Krabby Patties. It's, it's the perfect crime. But they still get a good comedy of errors out of it. Not so much errors, but just misunderstandings and mishaps. Small ones, so they don't, you know, drag. The good thing about the comedy in this episode is that it doesn't drag. It's always going to the next scene, the next big joke that they want to tell. And this episode has a lot of big jokes. It's a pretty uncommon but not impossible to find pairing of Patrick and Squidward for most of it. We know Spongebob and Patrick's dynamic quite well at this point. We know Spongebob and Squidward's dynamic pretty well at this point. But not too many scenes of Patrick and Squidward just hanging out and trying to get a plot going. And uh, Patrick's pretty in character here. I mean, he's being an annoying customer to Squidward. That's the point of the first half of this episode. But he's not being malicious. He's just sort of not being very smart about things, and, well, Patrick's not a very smart character. And I like how even with the customer that came in earlier, it feels like no one in this episode except Mr. Krabs and Squidward treated any differently from the actual Krusty Krab. Like, if Patrick just wandered in one day and people were telling him it was a hotel, he'd probably treat it exactly the same as the situation here. And Spongebob is basically still an eager beaver of an employee, just helping out any way he can and not making too much of a fuss of his grill being moved or anything. It's not exactly from his POV, so sure. And this is one of the few times around this period of the show where Squidward is allowed to just rage quit and leave the story when he wants to, and 
it turns out fine for him for a little while. Like, you get episodes where, you know, he's sort of stuck being the recipient of slapstick and just general misery for the whole thing, but this one sort of gives him a brief holiday in the second half, which is kind of relieving for some fans who were getting tired of that shtick by now and would get much more tired of it by season six, but... You know, you've still got that classic Squidward getting annoyed by people around him dynamic. Heck, he's even peeling a burger again. When was the last time he did that? <laughs> so, no real complaints about this episode from me, personally. I mean, there is a bit of gross out, but it's not any more graphic than something like Just One Bite. I just think that... M Nearly all the jokes in this episode are great. The setup is amazing <laughs> for what it is. And uh, the animation is top notch too for season four, which, as I've said repeatedly, is my favorite season visually. I do think that a lot of this comes down to the background artists putting their all into just a lot of scenes and shots that are only going to be on screen for a few seconds at most, but still add to a story that wouldn't work if it wasn't so, you know, fancy and high class and clean. <laughs> I say this as Squidward's about to give Patrick a bubble bath. And again, Patrick isn't being a jerk about it. He just doesn't quite understand that he's annoying people. But Squidward, when, when this portion of the story begins and Squidward is taking full advantage of the plaque that Mr. Krabs has put on the wall, you know, that is taking advantage of the situation. Sure, he's no worse than Patrick in some aspects, but he's no better because he's doing this with the intent of annoying Mr. Krabs, which in its own way is satisfying after... You know, all the hardship Mr. Krabs puts him through. But it's also just, you know, treat people at places like this how you would like to be treated. Just don't go out of your way to make their lives, you know, less, you know. You know what I'm trying to say, right? There is a lesson to be learned in here that makes it a little more complex than your average, you know, Squidward's going through misery sort of episode. It's showing that, you know, Squidward can take advantage of a situation when he wants. And that is what makes it more satisfying when this all backfires and he ends up in the hospital. And another weird thing about this episode is... This is the first appearance since, I think, Falls in April of Squidward's mother, who returns with a new design and a very different voice. And a scene is coming up in a, about a minute, but I figured I might as well talk about it anyway, because, you know, Squidward's mother is not an important character of the show at all, but it is something that you think about in the back of your head, like... Who raised Squidward to be like this? But uh, I think Squidward's mother is a fun character in this sh certain episode. But the weird thing is, this design is then used for Squidward's grandmother and the later seasons and the Patrick Star show. So I don't know what's happening with Squidward's family, like... They then redesigned the mother to look a little more like how his mother did in Fools in April. So I don't quite know what's going on with the family. It's best not to think about it, I think. I guess one little piece of trivia that I can leave this certain section off with is that 
This is the episode that they used for the second disc of the Season 4 Volume 1 DVD set. And, you know, I think it's ironic that the first disc is Good Neighbors, which is full-on showing part of the mayhem and destruction of that episode, whereas the Grusty Towers art is a lot more relaxed. It's kind of showing, hey, things are going to work out for these characters in one portion of one episode before they get into a pool accident. Only real, you know, squabble we can have about the cover for that is Spongebob's uniform is red there, whereas it's blue in the episode, but it's not a big deal at all. You think of bellboys, you think of red, but, you know, blue works better for Spongebob in some of his outfits to better distinguish it from his usual brown attire. And here we go, just a second and a half of Spongebob, Patrick, and Squidward all laughing together before it all goes awry and they go to the hospital and... I'm surprised they haven't done this episode yet of Mr. Krabs turning the Krusty Krab into a hospital. I guess it would be hard to turn into a Krabby Patty related scenario, but yeah, just a thought. This episode gave me many thoughts, like, this is great, this is a very strong episode, and high recommendation if you haven't seen it in a while. <laughs> Mrs. Puff, You're Fired was written by Casey Alexander, Chris Mitchell, and Tim Hill. You can definitely tell that this is a Chris Mitchell and Tim Hill script, because it is diving a teeny bit deeper into an aspect of the show, sort of like Crabs vs. Plankton or Friend or Foe, where we've got this staple of the show, Spongebob and Mrs. Puff's relationship, sort of coming into question and being tested in some way. Now, for the most part, this always has to happen for a story to progress. There has to be some sort of conflict or change to the status quo. But this one goes the full nine yards. It's it's saying, Mrs. Puff, you're fired in the title. And uh, can you really blame this Mr. Fitz character for being suspicious? Because they retcon a few things about Spongebob and Mrs. Puff's boating school for the sake of this episode. A, a very slight retcon to the number of times he's failed boating school. It, it used to be 37, Meow. sorry, 38, but now it's 1,258,056, which will make a good trivia question. And SpongeBob is even more nervous behind the wheel. Well, it maybe not so much more nervous than in something like Doing Time, but Still, it is getting a little zanier. And I do really wish that they'd bring this Mr. Fitz character back, rather than just being a background character. Because there is a dynamic between him and Mrs. Puff that is hinted at here, but I think could result in something stronger down the line. I mean, this is a good start for this character, but when are we going to see him again? That's what I'm asking. Oh, and here's the star of this episode, the ever-iconic Sergeant Roderick, played by Robin Sachs. Uh, so, this is a British guy. He kind of sounds Australian to me, but maybe that's just Finding Nemo turning Sharks Australian in my mind, but... British actor became more popular in America after appearing in the action show Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And whenever a British actor appears in anything I like, first question on my mind is, hmm, did they appear in Doctor Who? And yes, he made an appearance in Torchwood two years before he died in 2013. So I haven't seen Torchwood in a while, but that's good for me to know. 
But uh, I really like this character. He is the total opposite of Mrs. Puff in some aspects. Whereas Mrs. Puff deep down cares about Spongebob and wants him to pass the test just so she can be happy, he can be happy, they can go on with their lives. The sergeant is just completely ruthless. He doesn't care about Spongebob's feelings. He doesn't care about his safety on this course. He is kind of a villain of a teacher and... You know, it works putting Spongebob up against this sort of drill sergeant character, which is why they do it again next year. And oof, I, I love the look of this obstacle course, even if it does kind of remind me of the driving episode of Rocco's Modern Life. But you know, the longer the show, longer any show goes on, the easier it is to repeat itself and repeat other shows. Now, this little bit of animation coming up where... Spongebob gets a little pebble stuck in his hand. It is kind of strange to me. It kind of feels like a prelude to all that animation in season six, where they make him a lot more robotic and alien. And I don't really like that sort of animation being used for a character meant to be as relatable to everyone as Spongebob. But I kind of get it. Like, a pebble in your hand that deep is probably going to be difficult to register as anything but pain. So I get why it's done like that. It's just something to look out for in Casey's episodes in particular in coming years. And I think they also reuse the footage of the live action sponge coming out of the water from No Weenies Allowed. So no issue with that. And here we sort of get to what makes Spongebob a peculiar boating student again, where he just cannot seem to fully grasp certain things, but he can fully grasp other things quite well, like how to build a rocket ship and how to drive as long as he's blindfolded. And... If I wanted to be pretentious, I could say that this is saying something about the education system and how it's sort of difficult for some kids to learn the right way, so they learn a different way, which may or may not be helpful for them later in life. But, uh, okay, that was completely pretentious, but it is sort of what they're doing with Spongebob here. And even though this is the only real episode about Spongebob in boating school in season four, there's Driven to Tears, but that's more about Patrick going to boating school. The theme of the season four volume one box, as in the full-on cover art, is of Spongebob in, like, crashing through a, I think it's a wooden wall? It's easy to mistake for brick due to the color of red they use, but I, I've always really loved that cover. I think it was drawn by Heather Martinez, who worked as a storyboard artist on the second and third seasons, and has recently come back, and she can draw a Spongebob and the gang pretty dang well, so that's pretty good. And it's good that they, you know, have an identifier for the season starting, well, only really being super active for seasons four and five to a degree. Because the first three season box set covers, aside from Squidward's sombrero poking out, I mean, they don't exactly identify a particular episode of any season, but the season four volume one set, you look at that and you think, oh, that's the season with Mrs. Buff, you're fired. Or just, you know, a really chaotic boating school episode. And, you know, it works. It is an iconic visual, and I'm sad that on reprints they've replaced it with The Gift of Gum, because that isn't an episode I rate highly, but that's neither here or there. The here is... You know, 
now we're going into this big sort of SpongeBob destroying the city and boating school mayhem. Not unlike Hall Monitor, but he's in a boat this time that makes it a little more true to the idea. One of my only serious problems with this episode is it's called Mrs. Puff You're Fired, but she is a complete non-entity in the middle portion of the episode. This is the first time she's appeared since the opening scenes, but it isn't really about her. It's about the sergeant and Spongebob, which is an excellent dynamic, but I think we could have gotten in one scene in the middle of Mrs. Puff enjoying her solitude away from work. Oh, and this scene, you know, confused a lot of fans because it made some people think, you know, did the sergeant die? No, he, I think he came back as a background character later on, but, you know, that's, that's nice, he didn't die. Also, good choice of music for this big, chaotic scene. They... Spongebob usually has two panic themes, Grass Skirt Chase, which debuted first, and Spongemonger, which debuted in season two, but became more prevalent in the post-movie era. And I like that they use both of them. Like, you know it's going to be chaotic when both the panic themes are used in full force. I think one of the reasons I wish we got more of Mrs. Puff for this episode called Mrs. Puff You're Fired is that it sort of makes the sad ending feel a little undercooked. Like, it makes it clear that, you know, Mrs. Puff has a job to do, that she's one of the only people capable of putting Spongebob on the right track, and that Spongebob does care about her and wants their dynamic to continue, but I don't know, we maybe could have gotten more of it, but that's all I really have to say about Mrs. Puff, You're Fired. G really good set of episodes this time. My question time for you last time was, what is your least favorite ending in a Spongebob episode? Uh, Sparkling with Night said uh, the ending of Boating Buddies, Oof, that's a dreadful one. I, I'm i inclined to agree with you. Brendan Barney has a few. A Pal for Gary, Boating Buddies, Yours, Mine, and Mine, The Krabby Chronicles, Spongebob, Your Fired, and Little Yellow Book. Uh, Andrea Elphus, the ending of Spongebob, Your Fired. Dashiell, unpopular opinion, but Squid on Strike. It is, it is quite an unpopular opinion to say the worst of anything is from a pre-movie episode, but you have your reasons. Bryce Fawn... It's a mix of a pal for Gary and one course meal. And Snake Man, the ending of Yours, Mine, and Mine. Uh, all valid answers. But my question time for next time we do this is, who's a guest star you'd love to see in Spongebob? Because I've always thought Weird Al Yankovic was basically the perfect celebrity choice for Spongebob in anything. He's been a fan since near the start. Like, he's posed with Spongebob stuff. But they've just never brought him on, and it's really confused me. But, you know, never say never, Spongebob's going to be around for a while. Maybe he's going to be in the 25th anniversary. Maybe he's going to be in the 50th anniversary if they both live long enough. But, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on who you'd love to see, you know, performing in an episode of Spongebob, because they brought in a bit more guest star power for this era, so... You know, what's on my mind is probably what was on their mind in 2006 too. But next month, when SpongeComs returns, it's going to be for more uninvited guests to the world of SpongeBob. Some ghostly and primitive uninvited guests in Ghost Host and Chimps Ahoy. Goodbye for now. <laughs>